Good morning, everyone. My name is Manisha, for those of you who don't know me. And this is Nayaswami Bharati, and it is our joy to be with you this morning. My husband, Dambara, is in New Zealand right now with Asha, Nayaswami Asha. And they, she is doing a lecture tour. <coughs> Excuse me. She's doing a lecture tour for six weeks in New Zealand. And Dambara is her warm-up act. <laughs> so he'll be doing the music and chanting. And Brian McSweeney and his friend Rachel are there. And they're videotaping it. And Jill Barker is doing all the logistics, arranging the van and the book sale table and all of that. So they're just this happy little entourage there right now embarking on their six weeks of reaching out to people in New Zealand. And he sends his love and his joy to all of you. Um, this week's topic is about intuition versus intellect. And it's a topic that I've given a lot of thought and attention to over my years at Ananda because it is, I've spent most of li my life completely in my intellect. And I always knew that there was this little thing that would take me places that turned out to be really good if I would pay attention to it. And I just really didn't know any much about that. Was it luck? You know, that type of thing. But coming to Ananda, where we focus on developing that aspect of our spiritual gifts, intuition, and it opened a whole new world to me. Swami talks about how the intellect can really confuse you, but your intuition can lead you to a place where you are in harmony with all that's going around you, going on around you, and what's coming towards you. It just helps you harmonize with the rest of the world. And that's a wonderful thought, to be able to be in harmony with everything that's around you. So it's something worthwhile to strive towards. Swami defines intuition as the innate ability to, to perceive truth directly not by reason or logic, but the simple knowing from within. And that is a wonderful definition of what that feeling is when it comes to you. Um, going back to the intellect and how it had been such a big part of my life when I first came to Ananda and getting to know different people, there was one woman who was very involved in Ananda. And so we interacted quite often. And she always irritated me. And I could tell that I always irritated her. So we both were irritated by the other person, and we both knew that the other person <laughs> knew that we were irritated by them. <laughs> so it was just, we were, we were polite to each other, and we tried very hard to have the conversation that needed to happen, and we knew it was going to be frustrating, but we just sort of like bulged our way into it, and we just got to the end of the conversation. And, had our say, and then we went about our way. And it was just not fun at all. And I thought about that a lot, because I wasn't sure why this person irritated me. So as I started to learn to open my heart a little bit more, I asked the questions, and I asked them in the right way, instead of, why does she bug me so much? I said, why does she bug me so much? And the answers started to come in as I got to know more about her. She had been raised in a very uh, tight-knit, fundamentalist Christian community, uh, to the point that her mother, when she was a teenager, at that time her mother was shunned by the rest of the community because she divorced her husband. And her husband, I don't remember the details of the husband. He, I don't know if he beat her or if he was having a string of affairs. I don't remember what it was, but I do remember that it was something that she should have left that situation. But in the eyes of this fundamentalist community, she had made her vow to God that she would be with this man until death do us part. And it didn't matter what the circumstances were. She should be there. And so she was shunned for the rest of her life. She was shunned because she had divorced this bad match. 
So I thought about that, that I had been raised Lutheran, and it's not quite as tight in a community, but there's a lot of, you will do this, but you will not do this, black and white, and I am going to impose that on everybody I know and judge them based on how well they adhere to my list of do's and don'ts. And I realized that it was that background that would peek through every once in a while. She would become stern, my, this devotee I'm talking about now. She would become stern, and she would tell me how it was supposed to happen, that this fertilizer went on first, and then you add the kelp. <laughs> and it was just, it just irritated me no end. But on the other hand, I really liked this woman. She had a gentle side to her. She was completely devoted to Ananda, to Master. She had a streak of joy in her a mile wide. So I started listening to my heart about her and noticing all of her wonderfully uplifting qualities and ignored that part of my intellect that made it so complicated about what she should and should not say to me. And I set that aside. And coincidentally, she started doing the same thing, too. I don't know what it was about me that irritated her. There's a lot of options, but I don't know. (laughs) I don't know which one or which group of them irritated her so much about me. But at the same time, within about a two- or three-week period, we both set aside all that judgment and stuff that just irritated us about the other person. We just set it aside and started focusing on our good qualities, the good qualities of the other person. And it just turned things around. So we became friends, not close friends, because our interests didn't overlap very much, but friends enough that we enjoyed our conversations. And she told me that this fertilizer should go on first and then, and then put the kelp on top of it. OK, I can do that. And it just shifted everything because we both opened our hearts and got out of our intellect. We followed our intuition. So be careful about things that your brain overthinks. Your brain knows you really well, and it can trick you into a lot of assumptions that aren't, don't have any place in reality except in your brain. So it's not all that trustworthy. Whereas your heart, your heart tells you what truth is. The heart is the receiver, the receptor for intuition. That's where the signal comes in, is to your heart chakra. And it's the, the more and more you can enhance that ability to listen to that signal that's coming through your heart, the more and more you'll be able to be in harmony with everything that's happening around you or that's moving towards you. You'll be prepared for it. It will be exactly what you wanted it to be. One time I was um, uh, creating an altar. Swami Kriyananda was in town. He was going to be at Palo Alto for an entire week, and we had an event planned every night. And someone had the wonderful idea to have a new altar every night. And, and, so I was, and so I was in charge of the altar one of these nights. And so there's this wonderful floral well, warehouse not far from the Mandir in Palo Alto, and that's where we would buy all of our flowers. So you walk into this warehouse filled with blossoms, and they are just so happy and joyful and bright, and there's just mountains of them. You want carnations? You could fill a mansion with carnations. It's just this plethora of beauty. And so I walked into this warehouse, into the cold room, and these flowers just jumped out at me. My god, those are beautiful. I love those colors. So I just ignored everybody else, and I just went and got those two colors, pink and purple. And I built this altar for the evening around that pink and purple color. When Swami walked through the door, he was wearing pink and purple. Now, I have no idea whether he felt the joy that I felt when I saw those flowers. And when he went to pick out his shirt, he said, oh, I haven't worn this one in a while. I'll wear this one. 
or whether we both tuned into something else, or whether I tuned into him, I don't, I don't know how it works. I just know that it does work. If you follow the joy that you receive in your heart chakra, it's going to really unfold some wonderful surprises. And you realize that you're having a conversation with the divine. The divine is talking to you. You're responding. The divine is talking back. Poof! Little burst of joy. And it can be that way more and more throughout your day, the more you're able to keep your heart open throughout the day and be a continuously listening station. Um, there's, um, Swami also talks about how we're so influenced by things we don't even know are going on. He talks about being in his apartment in San Francisco, and it was on a pretty busy street, so there was lots of noise, but in the back, he, he was, his roof was in the back of the building, so he didn't hear any of that street noise. And so it was a quiet apartment, very peaceful, and he would go back there and he would be doing his work, planning the next class, whatever was on his list, and he would be very peaceful. But then he also noticed that sometimes when he was up late at night or woke up in the middle of the night, that it was a different type of stillness. He was in the same apartment, but it was 3 o'clock, and San Francisco was quiet. Everybody else was asleep. And he realized that it's not just the audio noises that can be distracting. It's the energetic noises that can come at you in the middle of a bustling, urban, high-rise environment like San Francisco, which is so high energy. And when it goes soft at night and quiet at night, there's a difference in that. So it, it, it's very different from the quiet of a quiet room in the midst of all of that energy. So there are ways that you can enhance that joy center so that you can receive things better. You can spend time in nature. You can spend time in seclusion. The easiest one is you can spend time in meditation. When you go into meditation and you enter that stillness, that's what really activates your heart chakra and lets you be a receiving station for that so that you can move through your day in a wonderful way that is in tune with everything that's happening around you. So he also talks about being discerning about information that comes to you. It's important to have feedback from other people. That's why living in community is so powerful, because people get to know you really well, and they can reflect back to you some of the things that you're not aware of for yourself, and you can learn from that. But you have to be discerning about it, and the only way you can be discerning is through that same heart chakra. There was a gentleman who, a devotee, and he was telling a group of us one night about how he had struggled with depression all of his life, and that he would go into dips, and then he would come out and be fine for weeks and weeks and months and even years, and then something would happen, and he would go back into this depression, and that when he was in the midst of that depression, he sort of lost contact with his brain. He couldn't think clearly, and he couldn't make decisions. He just... He couldn't process information. He would get frazzled real easily. A lot of things that maybe others can relate with it. I just, I can't deal with this right now. Only that was a constant thing for him when he was in the midst of this. Now, the other half of the story is that there was a great devotee of masters. Her name was Kamala. I don't remember her last name. Silva. Silva. Ka Ka Kamala Silva. Thank you. And she was a devoted disciple of masters, very heart-opened, connected with masters. She could hear masters' thoughts wherever she was in the world. Now, she didn't live at Mount Washington with the rest of the monks and nuns. She lived in the Bay Area around Berkeley. And she had a center there, an Ananda Center, and she devoted her life to that. But she was a little bit on the outside of SRF because she didn't live at Mount Eden. Oh, sorry, 
that's the name of the warehouse, the flower warehouse. <laughs> Mount Washington. Um, and so in her later years, she became, she had dementia or senility. I'm not sure. She, she lost access to her brain. And SRF wouldn't take her in. So Ananda took her in. And she went up to the village, and she lived in the, uh, the guest house, what's now the guest house, next to the Crystal Hermitage for months, maybe a year. I'm not sure how long. But Ananda took care of her. And she had a group of stuffed animals that she related with. And she believed that they were real animals. And she took care of them. And she just had this wonderful childlike devotion. And Asha talks about how she went up and the first time she met Kamala and realized how much her mental capacity had deteriorated. She was just mortified. And she went to Swami and she said, my god, Kamala, her brain is gone. And Swami said to her, Asha, it's OK. It's only her brain. And that, that really took Asha by surprise because she was so dependent on her brain. Dependent, she, she had such a fine-tuned brain that she used it to wonderful degrees. She was so powerful with her brain. And so the thought for her of le losing her brain was the worst fate in the world. But hearing that come from Swamiji, it let her think about it differently, that it's only her brain. She still has her joy. She still has her devotion. She still has her love for these animals. She still has her love for Master. Uh, someone handed Kamala a book once, and it, she flipped through it and found a picture of Master. And she just like ripped up the picture of it, because it was a picture of Master. And it, it was a treasured book. And the person like <laughs> took it back to you know, not have it be destroyed by, the, by having a page ripped out of it. But she just, she had that love and joy and devotion still completely intact. It was only her brain that she had lost. So this gentleman that I was describing earlier, he used that story to get him through his low points. He kept telling himself, it's only my brain. I still have my devotion. I still have my love of God and master. I'm OK. It's only my brain. So he was able to use examples outside of himself. When his intuition wasn't working for him, he was able to use information from outside of himself that he saw reflected around him in the community in which he lived. And it got him through those low periods of his depression. So it's very important to be open in your heart so that you can discern what is truth coming not only from the divine, but through people around you that you trust and love and know from day to day. So this is how you build up to being able to move through your day in a fabulous richness, a rich tapestry of interwoven truths and little surprises like the pink and purple shirt that Swami wore to the talk that night. And just it's just little tiny miracles like that let you know that I'm in constant dialogue with the divine. This is sacred. My life has a sacredness to it that fills me with joy. Um, Swami says that true guidance, this guidance that you receive in your heart, is surrounded by calm, clarity, and joy, and that you should beware of nervousness or agitation. If you're excited about something like, I just know I should buy that pair of shoes. I just feel so much joy around that. I'm going to go out. I'm, just, I'm going back. They're the perfect color. I'm going to go get it. That agitation and excitement, that's not true you know, intuition. That's not a divide message coming from you. Now, I'm using, I'm using a, a superfluous example of buying the shoes. But even in weightier things, if you feel agitation around it rather than joy, that's your signal. And the more you start trusting that and listening to those signals, the more, uh, the more strength the signals will gain. And they will be even a better guide for you. And 
intuition can come to you in a lot of different forms. Some people talk about seeing colors that join, that, um, that guide them. And I don't see colors at all, so it's hard for me to imagine that. But one of the ways that the divine talks through me is numbers. I love the number three. And I don't know why I love the number three. It has a nice shape. I don't know. It's a sacred number. I have no idea. But whenever I see threes, I just get this boop, little burst of joy. And I was driving down the street one day, and I was trying to decide whether or not to go visit my friend who lives in Paris. And she and I have been friends for years and years. And she was pregnant and bored to death because it was a difficult pregnancy. Uh, there was some amniotic fluid that was leaking through a small hole in the sac that surrounds the, the baby. And so she had been confined to bed. And she's a very active person. So she was just, it was horrible for her. And so I was trying to decide whether or not to go visit my friend. Because I could go there and I could entertain her for two weeks and read to her, talk to her. We just, we could talk for hours and never run out of more things to say. So I could go and I could really help her for two weeks of this bed confinement. Or I could go there and she would get out of bed and clean the house and cook meals for me and lose the baby. Which one should I do? Should I go or should I not go? Because I could really help her. Or she could lose the baby. That's bigger than should I buy that pair of shoes. And right when I was thinking about this, I thought, I think I should just go see her. And I looked down at my dashboard. And my clock said 3.33. <laughs> and this feeling of joy just burst out, out of my heart center. And it was calm. It was clear. Of course I should go see her. She's smart. She knows she can't get up and clean the house. She's not going to be endangered by company coming to see her. She'll be fine. And I will relieve her waiting for at least two weeks. It will help her so much. And because of those threes, and the, combined with the joy that I felt when I saw those threes, I knew it was OK for me to go. And I did. We had a great time. She stayed in bed the whole time. I went and bought diapers and baby powder and all that kind of stuff and brought it back for her. And I cooked her meals. And we had a great time. So it's, it can be viewed as superstition. Oh, I saw a three. I should go. But the key is that joy. So nourish that joy. Make it Make it an integral part of how you move through your day. And it will serve you and keep you in harmony with all that's going on around you. I'm going to close with this wonderful prayer by Paramahansa Yogananda. Oh, Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, I will reason. I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right thing I should do in everything.